sorry that it took so long, like I was having problems with my presentation, but now we, we are here and ready to, to start. Uh, I'm very sorry that it took so long. Um, this time, wait a second, please. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like you were waiting so long. Uh, let's start the class. Uh, this time uh, we are going to talk about a uh, privity of contract. Uh, this is within the, the, the subject of who can enforce the terms of a contract. Um, who can tell me, uh, what do you think is privity of contract? Okay, well, privity of contract uh, determines uh, who can enforce a contract. Um, in general terms, only uh, one who is party to a contract can enforce it. Uh, so the doctrine of privity of contract uh, provides uh, that a contract cannot confer rights or impose obligations arising under it. Uh, on any person except the parties to the contract. Um, so the premise is that only the parties to a contract should be able to sue to enforce uh, the rights or claim damages, as such. Uh, however, there have been there there have been some problems with this doctrine uh, due to its implications upon contracts made for the benefit of third parties who are unable to enforce the obligation of the contracting parties. Uh, in, in other words, uh, the, the doctrine of privity uh, can defeat the intention of the parties to a contract. Uh, so in this uh, situation, uh, the Contract Act of 1999 was enacted and provides uh, that uh, and provides a party a, to a contract with a method of avoiding the doctrine of privity of contract. A, to provide a third parties to the contract with a right to enforce a, the contractual term. Um, okay. okay, what we are going to talk a, in this lecture in this lecture, uh, well, I have talked uh, a little about the doctrine of privity. Uh, we are going to uh, to see also and talk about the Contract Act of 1999, uh, which is the right of, of third parties, uh, the rights conferred on third parties at common law, and the liability imposed upon third parties. Uh, that's what we are going to talk about uh, uh, today. So the doctrine of privacy. Uh, what does the doctrine of privacy of contract provide? What do you think like this doctrine uh, says? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> perfect. So, what 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 do you think? Like, um, 
that the doctrine of privacy uh, of contract provides. Okay, the, the, this uh, doctrine of privacy, exactly, third parties can enforce a contract. A provider that a contract a cannot confer rights or impose obligations arising under it on any person or agent except the parties to the contract. A, the premise is that a, only the parties to a contract a, should be able to sue to enforce their rights or claim damages. A, so the doctrine is primarily concerned with the question of who can enforce a contract. Um, there are two aspects to this doctrine. Um, one is like only uh, parties to a contract are bound by it. Uh, what does it mean? A, I, a and B uh, have a contract and uh, they cannot, but their contract uh, compels C, who is a third party to the contract, to do something or to refrain from doing something. Uh, so the obligation of C will be unenforceable because C is not a party uh, to the AB contract. Um, so this aspect, you know, is unobjectionable. But the second aspect uh, to this doctrine is like only the parties to a contract uh, can get rights and benefits from their contract. Uh, let's say A and B have a contract. Uh, A and B cannot, by their contract, confer an enforceable benefit upon C, even if A and B clearly intend to confer a benefit upon C. Okay? Uh, so here is where this aspect is objectionable because there are situations in which the parties to the contract uh, clearly want to confirm or clearly want to in, uh, clearly intend to confirm an enforceable benefit upon a third party. So, uh, because of the doctrine of privity, uh, the denial of the benefit to the third party defeated the intention of the contracting parties. Okay. Uh, as common law, the parties to a contract cannot impose, impose a burden on a third party, nor they can confer a benefit on a third party. Uh, here in the slide, you can see this uh, case, Tweedle versus Atkinson from 1861. So the facts of this case are uh, the following. A couple were getting married, so the father of the bride enter an agreement with the father of the groom that they would each pay the couple a sum of money. The father of the bride died without having pain. The father of the son also died so was unable to sue on the agreement. The groom, uh, who is the son of one of the parties of the contract, like could it be called the third party, made a claim against the executor of the will, but the court held that the, this claim failed because the groom was not a party to the agreement and the consideration didn't move from him. So therefore, uh, the, the groom, who was a third party, was not entitled to enforce the contract, okay? Because uh, he was not a party to the agreement, and he didn't give any consideration. Um, we can see other cases uh, that illustrate the problems created by the doctrine of privity. Uh, one of the cases uh, that you know that we can see this problem uh, is Dunlop, Dunlop Nomadic Tire versus Selfridge and Company. Uh, what are the facts of this case. Uh, Dunlop made tires. 
So this company Dunlop didn't want them sold cheaply, but they wanted to maintain a standard resale price. So Dunlop agreed with its dealers. Uh, one of Dunlop dealers was a uh, Dew and Company, uh, not to sell the tires below its recommended retail price. So it also bargained for dealers to gain the same undertaking from the retailers. So in this case, one of the retailers was Selfridge. So if the retailers did sell below the list price, they would have to pay five pounds a tire in liquidated damages to Dunlop. Okay, so that was the agreement that Dunlop made with its dealers. So Dunlop was a third party to a contract between Selfridge and Dew. Remember that Selfridge was one of the retailers and Dew was a, a Dunlop's dealer. So a, when Selfridge sold the tires at below the agreed price, a Dunlop sued to enforce the contract a, and Selfridge argued that it could not, it, Dunlop could not enforce the burden of a contract between itself and you, uh, which Selfridge had not agreed to. So uh, at first, at trial, the judge found in favor of Dunlop. But in appeals, uh, the damages and the injunction were reversed, uh, saying that Selfridge was not a principal or an agent and that was not bound. And the issue put uh, to the core was whether Dunlop could get damages from Selfridge without a contractual relationship. Okay. Uh, one of the judges uh, based his argument on three fundamental principles of law in law. Uh, first was the doctrine of privity that requires that only a party to a contract can sue. Uh, second, the doctrine of consideration requires a person with, who, with whom a contract not under sin is made is only able to enforce it if there is consideration from the promisee to the promisor. And third, the doctrine of agency requires that the principal not naming the contract can only be sued if the promisor was contracted as an agent. So in the application to the part, uh, the judge Helene could not find any consideration between Dunlap and Selfridge, nor could he find any indication of an agency relationship between Dew and Selfridge, and consequently, uh, Dunlap's action failed. Okay, so we can see here like the problems uh, that arise from the doctrine of privity. Now we are going to talk about uh, the Contracts Act of 1999, that is the rights of third parties. Okay, uh, the Contracts Act of 1999 allows contracting parties to confirm an enforceable benefit upon a third party. So the Act reforms the doctrine of privity. It doesn't abolish it, okay? Uh, the primary reason uh, for reform of the doctrine of privity was to give effect to the intention of the contracting parties. Uh, because remember, like, uh, the doctrine of privity says, like, only the parties uh, of the contract can enforce the contract. So uh, the Act allows contracting parties, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to provide an enforceable benefit to a third party. Uh, the contracting party cannot impose a burden upon a third party, and uh, two kinds of benefits are available to a third party, okay? A positive benefit and a negative benefit. Uh, this negative benefit could be uh, the protection of an exclusion or limitation of liability clause. Okay, uh, the Act generally uh, applies to all contracts entered 
into after May 11 of 2000. Uh, however, there are certain types of contracts that are excluded from its application. Okay. Mm. Okay, under the, the Act, a third party to a contract can enforce a term of the contract in his own right in two circumstances, where the contract expressly provides that he may, and the second circumstance is where the terms of the contract purport to confer a benefit upon him, and nothing else in the contract denies the purported benefit. Okay, this circumstance, uh, this second circumstance, is more limited than the first one because uh, it is possible that uh, on a true construction of the contract, uh, that the presumption of an enforceable benefit can be rebutted. Okay, so the right of the uh, of the third party to inform a term of the contract is subject to the terms of the contract. Uh, this means that the parties to the contract can impose conditions upon the third party's ability to exercise his right under the contract. Uh, for instance, they can put a, a, a period of time for the third party to exercise his right. Uh, to illustrate this. I have mentioned here two cases. In the first case, uh, which is Machine Shipping Company Limited versus Cliff and Company Limited, uh, here what happened is that uh, Cliff uh, was a firm of chartering brokers. Okay? So uh, Cliff negotiated charter parties between Machine Shipping, uh, the ship owner, and various charters. Although Cliff was not a, a party to any of the charter parties, in each charter party, Nishim expressly agreed to pay a commission to Cliff. In each charter party was an agreement between Nishim and the charterers to arbitrate disputes. Nishim subsequently declined to pay the commission to Cliff. So Cliff commenced arbitration against Nishin uh, under the arbitration agreement in the charter parties, seeking to recover the unpaid commissions. So the arbitral tribunal uh, decided that it had jurisdiction. Uh, so Cliff stated that under the section one of the Act that we have mentioned here, where the contract is fairly provides that the third party uh, may enforce the terms of the contract, uh, the arbitral, arbitral tribunal indicated that Cliff have a right to enforce the provisions in the charter parties under which Nishin agreed to pay Cliff's commission. Uh, and second, under Section 8 of the Act, Cliff had the right to enforce the substantive terms through commencing arbitration under the arbitration agreement in each charter party. Uh, Nishin applied to the High Court to challenge uh, both grounds of the arbitral tribunal decision, uh, seeking a declaration that the arbitral tribunal would have no jurisdiction to the claim. The Court of Appeal found that a chartering broker was entitled to recover his commission by enforcing a clause, a clause under the charter party between a ship owner and a chartering by reason of section one, one of the act. So there was no evidence to conclude that the contracting parties intended that the charterings should not be entitled to rely upon the act. So in this case, a Cliff, a, as a third party, could inform the term of the contract. Uh, between uh, between Ishin and the other charter parties, uh, and this was because of section one of the Act. Okay, another case uh, is Prudential Assurance 
Company Limited versus heirs and all. Okay, in this uh, case, what happened is that a tenant, wait a second, please, that a tenant took an assignment of an under lease and entered into a deed with the immediate landlord, which contained a clause that restricted the landlord's ability to recover sums due under the under lease. The tenant got into financial difficulties and the landlord sought to enforce a warranty given by the previous tenant in respect of obligations under the lease. The High Court in this case held that even though the limitation on liability didn't contain an express provision allowing the previous tenants to rely on it, they were entitled to the benefit of the restriction by virtue of Section 11B, which is the second uh, circumstance that we talk about. Uh, uh, so that happened, you know, in this in this case, uh, like the the other tenants uh, could enforce the the exclusion of liability due to the due to the act and uh, when when uh, constructing all the all the contract uh, the terms confer them a benefit. Okay, uh, it is necessary uh, to make a, a distinction uh, between a contract which purports to confer a benefit upon a third party uh, and one which simply improves the position of a third party uh, if the contract is formed. So only uh, in the in the former case will the third party be able to rely up on the act. So uh, so for the act, for section 1, 1B of the act to apply, it must be one of the purposes of the bargain between the parties to benefit a third party rather than an incidental effect of contractual performance. Okay, so that must be one of the intentions. Um, uh, the contract must expressly identify the third party by name or class. Okay, uh, the application of section 1.3 that talks about the identification of the third party by name or class it was considered in the case Abramides versus Colwell. Okay. Uh, Usually, in this case, what happened was that uh, Mr. Aramides sued Mr. Colwell for failures in the refurbishment of his two bathrooms. Uh, the problem for Mr. Aramides was that the contract of refurbishment was with a company, Bathroom Trading Limited, and that company had no assets. So Mr. Aramides relied instead of an agreement that Mr. Cole will had with the company after the work was done to buy the company assets, complete customer orders, and settle the liabilities of the company. Uh, the claimant, Mr. Aramides, argued that he was a third party who was to benefit from that agreement and therefore could enforce the agreement uh, and have Mr. Cole will settle the company's liabilities to King. Uh, usually only a party to a contract uh, can sue on the contract, but there uh, are exceptions that uh, to that rule. Uh, however, in this case, uh, 
the third party was not identified uh, and the court says that there was not express reference to existing customer but just a general reference to liabilities. So uh, it was held that on the basis the third party required to benefit from the agreement was not sufficiently identified for the 1999 Act to operate. So uh, the claim of Mr. Abramides failed on this technical uh, ground. Um, can you give... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andrea, what are, what are from it's point one of this slide? Which one do you refer to this slide or the previous slide? This slide, okay. So in this, uh, okay, um, so like the contract uh, that is formed between uh, the parties uh, needs to be uh, one of the intentions of the contract uh, needs to be to give a benefit to the third party. Um, uh, for instance, it could be like a, a, a and B made a contract a, to pay a, a to pay an amount of money to C. So in that a, in that example, a, there is a benefit to C. But a, let's say another example of another contract where A and B A and B a, a made a contract a, and one of the in a, one of the incidental results of the contract will be that um, I don't know, like a, a, like C a, will improve a, a, will improve her position in, in a in a job, a, but that is not the real intention of the of the parties. So that that's the difference that we we need we need to see, like a, in the second contract. Uh, the intention of the party was not that C was going to improve uh, his position of a job, uh, but was just an incidental result of of the contract between A and B. Uh, let's talk about now. Let's continue talking about the contracts uh, Act of 1999. Uh, here, uh, uh, under the Act, uh, generally, the parties to a contract uh, cannot rescind the contract or vary it in, in a such a way as to either deny the right of the third party or alter the entitlement of the third party once the third party has acquired a right to inform a term of the contract. So, the third party receives protection from such a later changes to the contract in two situations, okay? Where the third party has, communi has communicated his assent to the term to the promisor, so communication by the third party, and the second situation is where the promisor is either aware that the third party has relied upon the term or the promisor can reasonably be expected to have foreseen that the third party would rely upon the term and the third party has relied upon the term. So 
but the ad also provides that the contracting party uh, can provide other whites in their contact. Okay, so uh, here, uh, like the third party uh, receive protection if there are changes to the contract, you know, when the third party has communicated his assent uh, to the promisor or the promisor uh, knows that the third party has relied upon the term or the promisor uh, can reasonable be expected uh, to have foreseen uh, that the third party would rely upon the term and the third party uh, has actually relied upon the term. Okay. Let's continue with the contract. Uh, 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 the ad only applies if the contracting parties intend it to provide the third party with the right to enforce a term of the contract. Okay. Uh, also, the parties may vary uh, the extent of the ad's application uh, and therefore the extent of the benefit provided to the third party uh, by a number of means. Uh, for instance, they could provide that the contract could be later varied or rescinded by the contracting parties. What we mentioned before, uh, the promisor can limit uh, or exclude any liability for negligence in the performance of his obligation to the third party. So, you know, like, so the, 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 the parties, like, they, they, they may decide a, a what is the extent of the ad's application. Okay. Uh, as we mentioned, the parties can exclude the ad's operation from their contract. Uh, the ad also provides the parties uh, with the ability to determine the extent of the benefit confirmed upon the third party. Okay? So this is about uh, the Contract Act of 1999, uh, which, as we mentioned before, it didn't abolish the doctrine of privity. Uh, but it helped the contracting parties uh, to kind of avoid the doctrine of privity. Okay. Uh, now we are going to talk about uh, the rights confirmed on third parties at common law. Okay. Uh, like I mentioned before, the Act didn't abolish the doctrine of privity. The Act preserves any rights the third party would have at common law. Uh, here we are going to see the different methods created um, in a number of cases for the purpose of avoiding the doctrine of privity of contract. Uh, the first one is enforcement by the promisee. Uh, what happened here is the A, the promisor, Promises B, the promisee, to pay C, who is a third party, uh, to pay C 100 pounds. B can sue to enforce this promise. The ad retains the promises right to enforce the contract. Okay? Uh, there is a case, the case that illustrates this. It is uh, this week versus this week. In this case, uh, Mr. Peter Biswick was a coal merchant, okay? Um, he was an, an, a, an, old, a, an old guy and he had no business premises. So his nephew uh, and his nephew, John uh, Biswick, helped him in his business. So, uh, in March 1962, uh, Mr. Peter Biswell and his wife were both over 70. Uh, they were not in good health, uh, and the nephew was anxious, anxious to get hold of the business uh, before uh, Mr. Peter Biswick uh, died. So they went to a solicitor 
uh, who drew up an agreement for them. Uh, the agreement between Peter Biswick and his nephew John Biswick was that Peter assigned his business to his nephew in consideration of the nephew employing him for the rest of his of his life and then paying a weekly annuity to Mrs. Biswick. Since the latter term was for the benefit of someone, no party to the contract, the nephew didn't believe it was enforceable and didn't perform it, making only one payment of the agreed weekly amount of five pounds. The nephew argued uh, that as Mrs. Biswick was not a party to the contract, she was not able to enforce it due to the doctrine of privity of contract. Okay. Uh, in the Court of Appeal, Lord Denning held that Mrs. Biswick was entitled to claim in her capacity as a third party intended to benefit from the contract. Exactly what Lord Denning said was, where a contract is made for the benefit of a third person who has a legitimate interest to enforce it, it can be enforced by the third person in the name of the contracting party or jointly with him, or if he refuses to join, by adding him as defendant. In that sense, and it is a very real sense, the third person has a right arising by way of contract. However, the House of Lords disagree with Lord Lenin in the Court of Appeal uh, that, the, that the law allows third parties to sue to enforce benefits under a contract. However, the House of Lords held that Mrs. Biswit, in her capacity as Mr. Biswit Administratix, could enforce the nephew's promise to pay Mrs. Biswit as annuity. Furthermore, Mrs. Biswit was entitled to specific performance of the contract. So in other words, the state of the promise was able to enforce the promise. Okay, so in this in this case, uh, the the widow of Mr. Biswit could enforce uh, the the contract between the nephew and the and the uncle uh, by because she was a representative of the state. Um, two, there are like two difficulties uh, that can happen when the enforcement is to be uh, is to made by the promisee. Um, the promisee, uh, the person inside the promisee, uh, may be unwilling or unable to enforce the contract. Uh, to find an appropriate remedy for B. The general purpose, uh, we are going to see, uh, you are going to see this uh, in the lecture of damages, but the general purpose of an award of damages uh, is to put the party where they would have been, but for the breach of contract. The general rule is that a, a contracting party cannot sue uh, to recover a loss that is really suffered by a third party, but this rule is subject to exceptions. Uh, there are a number of circumstances in which the promisee has been able to receive uh, an award of damages. Um, for instance, uh, we can uh, see in multiple booking when a person uh, books a holiday on behalf of himself and family members, is able to recover damages on behalf of the family members uh, when the contract is breached. Uh, so we can say that like when one person contracts in a social consumer capacity as a matter of convenience for the benefit of a number of other individuals, uh, so he, this person can recover damages on behalf of the, of the other uh, people. Um, another um, another another situation in which the promisee uh, has been able to receive a, an award of damages is uh, in the situation where seller 
contracts with carriers to take buyers' goods for delivery. So here, uh, it, it is said like when the seller and carrier a contract in contemplation of a second contract with the buyer, the seller can recover substantial damages on behalf of the buyer where the goods are lost or damaged. Uh, another situation is where contracts were the subject matter uh, will be acquired by a third party. Uh, here where a construction contract is made uh, which envisages the building being passed onto subsequent purchasers who are likely to be the ones suffering from any defect in the building and for whose benefit it is necessary to give the original customer a right to sue for damages, even though personally he will have suffered no loss. Uh, so here, like, uh, the main concern is in the future purchases that could suffer or are likely to suffer uh, from any defect in the building. Also, uh, another uh, circumstance is an order for the promisor to perform. In some situations, uh, it may be possible for the court to make an order for the specific performance of the contract. In other situations, it may be possible for a court to enforce a promise not to do something. Uh, the doctrine, uh, Andrea, the doctrine of uh, privity uh, doesn't make any distinction between uh, domestic and commercial contracts. Uh, and also, uh, the contract, uh, the Act of 1999, uh, it applies to all contracts in general. There is no any specific guidelines uh, for domestic contracts. Okay. Uh, let's talk about now a uh, agency. What can you tell me? What do you think is agency? You should be able to enforce rights. In agency, what happens is, for instance, aid uh, cannot or doesn't choose to negotiate directly with C. Uh, so A may authorize B to do so on his behalf. So the resulting uh, contract creates privity between A and C, with B dropping out of the picture. That 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 is a that is agency, okay. And now we are going to talk about a exceptions and limitations of liability. And there is a case here called the uh, Rumidon of 1975. In this, uh, here in exceptions and limitations of liability, uh, we need to, to think uh, that 
there are two contracts here, okay? Uh, the first contract is uh, between, uh, if A contract with B to carry eight goods and a clause is included, which limits or exempts the liability of B and C. Contract two uh, is B contract with C to unload eight goods. Should C damage the goods, A may bring an action in torts against C. C is unable to protect himself using the exception clause in contract one, since he's not a party to the contract. Uh, courts have stretched the agency concept in one particular situation to provide the third party with the benefit of the exclusion clause in contract one. For instance, it may be possible for B to contract with A as C's agent. Through B, A offers an exception of liability to C. C, in performing their contract with B and unloading the vessel, accepted this offer and a contract between C and A was formed, such that C could rely on the exception clause. In this case, the uh, Rumidon, uh, what happened was that a, a contract for the carriage of a machine by ship to New Zealand provided that the owners of the goods could not sue the carriers or stevedores unless any claim was brought within one year of the action, giving rise to the cost of action. The stevedores were independent contractors who were engaged to load and unload the ship by the ship owner. A, a stevedore damaged the machine while unloading it. The owner of the machine brought an action against the stevedore after the, the limitation period specified in the contract. The stevedore sought to rely upon the clause in order to escape liability. The, order, the owner of the machine argued that the stevedores could not rely on the clause as they were not pre private, private to the contract and had not provided them with any consideration. Uh, the court held that the stevedores have provided consideration in the form of services of unloading the machine. Uh, so, therefore, the stevedore had protection from the limitation clause and the claimant's action was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my God, this is okay. Uh, let's talk about collateral contracts. Uh, a collateral contract is a contract which exists alongside the main contract and which has separate consideration, sometimes provided by a different person to that in the main contract. Uh, occasionally, a third party may be made liable on the basis that he has made some promise in consideration of the promises entry into the main contract. Uh, I will invite you to, to read the case Andrews versus Hopkinson's uh, in life. I'm going to give you the facts very quickly. Here, Andrews uh, uh, bought a car from Hopkinson on higher purchase. Uh, before buying the car, Hopkinson said to Andrews, uh, it's it is a good little bus. I would stake my life on it. You will have no trouble with it. Uh, so Andrews uh, buy the, the, the vehicle uh, and the higher purchase agreement provided that Andrews' acceptance of delivery should be conclusive that the vehicle was complete and in good order and condition and in every way satisfactory. Uh, so Andrew signed a delivery note uh, acknowledging that he had taken delivery of the car and was satisfied to its condition. A week later, Andrew had a car accident. Um, and when the police examined the car, they, they, they found uh, the steering mechanism to be seriously defective. Uh, Andrew sued Hopkins for breach of express warranty that the car was in good condition. Uh, let's talk about trust. 
Uh, oh, I, I would like to, to mention another case regarding uh, in relation to collateral contracts. Uh, it is called the Shanghain Pier versus the Tell. Uh, here, uh, in this case, a collateral contract was found between the paint manufacturer and a peer owner in order to get around the problem that the peer owners were not parties to the contract of sale of the defective paint, which contract was, was between the painters and the manufacturer. The court, in this case, in Shanklin Pier versus the Tell, indicated that by specifying the paint to the painters, the peer owners provided consideration for the manufacturer's promises about the paint. Okay, uh, let's talk about trust. Um, the promisee as owner of the promise can constitute a trust of the promise. So B holds A promise on trust for C. Where this happens, B may recover from A the whole of the loss suffered by C uh, because of A's non-performance. A trust uh, of a promise negates privity altogether, for the third party must simply assert uh, that B is the trustee of the promise and that the benefit of the promise is the third party's. Uh, legislation. Uh, a statute may overcome the problem that would otherwise be posed by privity. Uh, it's not necessarily that you you know like uh, what these statutes are about, but I just I just wanted to to let you know. Uh, and finally, the liability imposed upon third parties. Um, in the case that is mentioned in the slide, uh, which is known as the Pioneer Concerning case, the the Privy Council applied principles of bailment to hold that the owner of the cargo was bound by the agreement between the bailee and the sub bailee, although the owner was not a party to the agreement. The liability upon the owner is imposed as a result of the sub bailment on terms rather than by a contract. I know like this, uh, this topic is a little uh, Dense and uh, but I invite you to read the cases that I have mentioned in the slide, uh, so you can uh, you can have a a better idea about uh, the doctrine of privacy, uh, the Act of 1999. On uh, just remember, like the Act of 1999 uh, doesn't abolish the doctrine of privity, um, but it gives the contracting parties, a, a, you know, like the option of confirm a, a right a, to a third party. A, thank you very much for your attention. A, if you have any question, please a, let, let me know. A, bye. Have a good weekend.